It is just a huge honor to be here at the 15th annual townie meeting in Las Vegas with a role model idol of mine, Vicki mm -hmm. McManus. And um, she's a registered dental hygienist. She's the co-founder of the Productive Dentist Academy and owner of a dental practice in Wisconsin. She's the collaborative author of Fundamentals of Outstanding Dental Teams and recently published her latest book, Frustration, The Breakfast of Champions. Very, very few people I brought back for a second time. I mean, I can, Thank count, you. I can count them all on one hand. Uh, but I, I, I think it's amazing because so many hygienists um, think, um, well, they're going to be an employee their whole life. They'll never get open their own um, um, independent practice. So right. I think it's only right. legal in Colorado. And uh, my God, you broke every model. <laughs> I mean, you're a hygienist who owns how many practices? Um, at the height of it, I own six. Yeah. And I think owning a practice uh, is probably a lot like owning a boat. Best two days are the day you buy them in the day you sell them. Yeah. So I went into practice ownership because I wanted to experience it, right? You tell me I can't do something, that's the thing I'm gonna go for. And uh, in Wisconsin, it was legal for non-dentists to own practices. And what I found was there were doctors. Was, it, was that, only, well, you say Wisconsin, was it many states that or was? I think Arizona's probably one. I've heard that there are about 13 states where you can. 13 states, okay. Yeah, and with the uh, management agreements, you can probably get around it in almost every state. And uh, my goal was to go in and buy legacy practices, those that were well running, probably just under a million dollars. We could pop them up to 1.2, get a young doctor in there. Eventually, they would buy me out. So I was going to be the financial placeholder and the business owner and train them. So that started in 2011. At the height of it, um, I had six. And six all in Wisconsin? Mm hmm And now we are at one. So in March, I transitioned out. I transitioned out two a few years ago, and then in March, I transitioned out three uh, in the group. And now I have the one practice, which I still love. I love that it gives me... Um, a think tank I love it gives me a place to try out new marketing plans it gives me a place to well, well um, implement. It, so originally did you I'm sorry I don't know why my stop was. Um, <laughs> so originally did you think you were gonna um, hold on to these things and own it and have a business that gives you net income every month every year I thought that it would come down to one or two and that is a big part of my retirement plan. So I've got a 10 operatory practice. I've got one dentist and a great long-term team there. We rent out part of the space to an orthodontic group, which so is So you fantastic. started with six and you're, you're holding this one now. Uh-huh. And but, I but, might go up but, to 10 but, again. But the, up to 10 offices? I'm, I may. Be, be, because I, I hear so much mixed information in the field. Um, I hear so many, um, like these corporate chains. Right. It's no doubt that there's a lot of them. And when I mean a corporate chain, I mean, has more than 50 locations. Sure. And for those, I think there's only about 35. Right. And a lot, a lot, of, a lot of the insiders are telling me, a lot of them have showed me accounting that 80% of those practices just break even or lose money. And they're making all their net income on one out of five offices. I could believe and, that. And the, the, um, the, the problem is the, the associate turnover is unreal. Right. And it's very, very high. And I, I mean, I'm just not seeing the evidence that um, you can open up 10 offices, have 10 associates and they're going to be employees for 10 years right. and have a steady business. Are you, are you seeing that or not seeing that? I think that? that's the most difficult model. It's out there. That's my model. So you take associate leaders and a, non, a long distance owner. That's the hardest model. I did not hit the easy button on that one. Um, so it was a difficult model. So I think the easiest model is solo practitioner with a dentist who's got his head screwed on right, knows his vision, knows how to communicate it to the team, team gets behind it, patients are taken care of. So that's square one in dentistry, you're, you're a an solo- own, An owner operator. Owner operator. Yeah, and, and that, that- But then you don't that. have the freedom. You can't walk away, right? You're tied to it. So growing from the inside out, multiple doctors, that makes sense. And you still have that control. Small. I, I, I see associates working if they working in the building with an owner-operator dentist. It seems like in economic theory that 
when when the dentist owns the place and they're carrying right. the loan right. and they bought this practice for seven hundred and fifty, right. they still got two hundred and fifty thousand dollars student loan, so they're incentivized in economic theory. They're carrying a million in debt. Right. My God, they they take online CE, they go to town meeting, right. they're motivated, they right. do these big numbers. And if an associate is in their eyeball view, um, they can mentor them, they can motivate them, they whatever. But when you take out that owner operator, yes, and now it's just a bunch of eight to five employees, right? The production seems to always sink down to a break even. Forty, you know, four out of five dental offices, and um, and 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 if there is one that's crushing it. He's usually incentivized by another reason, like he's a Mormon doctor who's got a stay-home wife with three kids, and she's pregnant, and he's just really motivated. Right. But if that guy was single, and all he wants to do is leave at five to go hit the bars and try to well, find you, some beautiful woman, you know, drinking a margarita at five o'clock, I mean, they're, they're, they, a lot of these always just lose money. I mean, do, do you see that, or do you not see that? I do see that, which just comes down to the human condition. Am I, right. am I going to be externally motivated to do what I'm supposed to do, or am I internally motivated to do what I do? So that's the key to the kingdom. Whoever comes up with the ability to uh, coach, lead, and guide, not just associate doctors, but the, the hygienist, the assistant, the front desk schedulers, to be internally motivated, to be with one purpose, right, doing the right thing at the right time for the right reason, then you got the whole ball of wax. So when you can get in there and, and really unleash the human condition in a positive way into one purpose, then they can be incredibly profitable. The profit's the byproduct of everything else. So I, I don't, it's not a plug and play. It's not a widget because you're dealing with people. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a scalable business in I can produce more widgets, right? Yeah. And, and the robots can do it. That's the that's the beauty and the challenge of dentistry is that you got to get to the people side of it, right? Yeah, I, I think I think the lawyers have been at this a lot longer than we have. I mean, they were doing <laughs> they were doing associates and partnerships, right. you know, before right. it was a concept in dentistry. And I, I think that with the uh, the corporate where they have just have um, you know the the thing they don't want to talk about and the thing that, that they all want to whisper about and talk about is is associate turnover, right? And the lawyers, so these associates, they're working at a at a corporate, and there's and from here to the the grave, they're just going to be an employee. So what the so what the lawyers did is uh, half of them are solo, but half work in group. They say, well, you know what, Vicky, you you give me blood, sweat, and tears. Someday I'll, you you might make partner. Right. And some make partner after like three years. Some are lame and take five years, seven right. years. Some never make partner. Right. But the, but there's but, a track. But the, but. I don't want to be uh, an employee. I want to be a partner. Right. But corporate says, "Oh no, the you know, the, the mothership is is the return of capital to the owner." And, well, and that's because they have shareholders that they've got to answer to, right? Right. So, in the situation that I've set up, I have what we call profit partners. So there's lots of you can be a debt partner, you can be a full equity partner. That's what you're talking about as equity partner, or you can be a profit partner. So in the practice that I kept, and they were all set up this way, and Priscilla's been with me, this is 2017, she's been with me six years now. So no She's turn a dentist? Yeah, no, no Dr. She, she's amazing. Uh, and she'll probably be with me another six years, depending on her health. So, and she's in her 60s, and she's fired up, and we're putting in 3D iCat next week, and we're putting in microscopes, and we're doing the DNA testing, and we're, going after the heart attack gene and they're just all fired up so you can some people get fired up by money other people get fired up by doing more complex dentistry others get fired up by um whole body saving lives you just got to figure out what fires people up yeah right? that, that and that's another really complicated about the associate thing i mean uh you know i mean that they have you don't invest in ce if you think they're gone in two years well if, if, if you you know the, the the government's done this journalism done it. You, you take a set of study models and and x-rays to a hundred different dentists you're going to get a hundred different treatment plans right so how do you i mean it's easy to scale an iphone right it's easy to scale bottled water right but when you're talking about a dentist where everybody looks in the mouth and sees something different right i see malocclusion you need a vis line i see sleep apnea right. i see you need veneer 
years. I see you have old amalgams. I, I, I think amalgams last twice as long as composite. If you got a really old amalgam, I'm like, good, you can go home and eat nails. The next kid is like, <laughs> no, we got to take all that out and replace it with plastic right. or file them all down to do crowns. And I'm looking at that thinking, well, God, if I had eight big amalgams, you filed eight of them down for crowns, two of them would need a root canal within right. five, you know. Right. So, so since there's no standardization a product, how do you have a corporate dental chain of a thousand dental offices where you walk in there and every one of them is going to have the same diagnosis? It's not, that's not going to happen. Dentistry right. is more art than science. And that's, and what you're talking about is calibration. So yeah. you've got to calibrate within the standard of care. And we talk about that all the time. So I don't know how other people do it. I just know how we do it. And it's one of the hardest pieces of it. And, and this isn't just a corporate conversation. This is between the GP and the specialist and who you're referring out to or what you're keeping in house and you know there's a whole lot of debate about whether GP should be placing implants or and all of this stuff and I think it goes down to you see what you're trained into seeing and you believe in what you believe and so we have to take it from standard of care includes amalgam on this end and full mouth rehab on that end and are you on that spectrum of care and can you justify through risk factor and prognosis your diagnosis? So, ooh, let's, let's rhyme that, all right? So risk factor and prognosis equals the diagnosis. So what's in the best interest of the patient given what we know today with the materials we have today, with our comfort level today, we go for predictability. That's my one and only criteria is what you're gonna do today predictable in your hands because if amalgam is what's predictable in your hands and you're going to get a better outcome than composite. That's just no other way of saying that, right? And I don't have to debate whether amalgam or composite is better or worse. I just know Dr. A can't do a freaking composite. So he has no business doing it till he learns how to do it. You know what I mean? But I, but I look at the insurance data and I mean, you're, you're talking about a sample size of hundreds of millions of right. fillings. Right. And the average posterior composite is lasting six and a half years. Right. And the average amalgam is about 38 years. Right. So when these guys say, well, I, I do it perfect. I have a rubber day. I might have that. No, it's the, it's the, it's the aesthetic health compromise. She wants tooth colored. Right. And you're going to pay a price for that. You're going to have a plastic filling or do syrup instead or do of a, a metal filling, you know? Yeah. And, but, and then, but then they become extremists. So then they carry that over to a grandpa with a liver spot on his head. Right. Who no one's even seen his molar. Right. But now he's a cosmetic dentist and he's accredited at the AACD. So he still goes plastic. Right. It's like, are you out of your mind? This, this guy goes fishing and, and bends his fishing hooks with, it, with his teeth. Yeah. And he doesn't have a cosmetic thought in his head. And right. grandma, grandma's wearing readers. Right. And, you know, and, and, and the doctor says proudly, I don't even have amalgam in my office. Yeah, you wouldn't want amalgam, which is all antibacterial. It's half mercury. The other half, silver, zinc, copper, and tin. Tin's an amalgam, anti. Right. You know, silver, the, the hygienists are, are, the pediatric dentists are coating pediatric decay with this silver diamine fluoride. The right. silver is antibacterial. Right. So this whole metal antibacterial filling of a filling that's going to die because of the biofilm, the biofilm right. bacteria are going to re-eat it out. So so that, that that's the point I'm trying to make. I'm not trying to talk so dentists in amalgam. I'm just trying right. to talk them into that. In these corporate dentistry models, you're never going to get all the dentists on the same page. It's um, never going to happen. Yes and no. I think I, I'm not going to name names because it would be unfair to the ones that I don't name. But there are some good models out there. There are some good models. Are you out talking there. about Heartland or Pacific Dental? I uh, see you start naming names. So, well, well, well. I, I, right? I, I think, I think. How could you not learn something from a corporate dental office who's got fifty locations? Right. Are, are you? Right. I mean, when dentists say, you know, they're that not all evil. They're, they're all evil. It's like, okay, well, why don't you they're open not. up fifty evil offices? Like, I think Aspen. Um, is one of the smartest and always targeting right. the poor areas with right. Medicaid, Medicare that the, the, the rich dentists don't want to go to. Right. They're all at the AECD meeting wanting to go to Beverly Hills. And Aspen's oh, yeah. like, then, then, then right go be there. Then go there. My sit right between Midwest and Aspen. Right? Yeah. And yeah. We, get a lot of, we get a lot of people running out of the back door of one of them and not a lot of people running out of the back door of the other. Right? And we're the traditional, you know. So who they run out of? Aspen Street and the poor. I'm not. See, oh, you got this dentistry see? uncensored. Yeah, yeah. This is dentistry uncensored. So, 
throw them under a bus. No, Come on. I'm not throwing, I don't do I'll that. I'll cover you your legal that. fees. You I'll cover that. your legal you fees. That. What I'm saying, though, is it still comes down to how you treat your people. Right. So if the staff were happy, the patients would be happier. This, this doesn't break down because the dentists aren't standardized. It breaks down because people are feeling like shit at, at work. They treat each other like crap. They treat patients like crap. And the patients are frustrated and they go, I'm out of here. I got to right. find somebody who can. And, and Phoenix, in Phoenix, what the number one complaint is on. Uh, well, 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 first of all, I just want to say this. Uh, to all my corporate dentistry buddies, um, nobody's keeping their customers for life. I mean, no. again, you're a hygienist. I mean, I, 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 we should start all conversation with this. If a hygienist worked 40 hours a week, which none of them do, and <laughs> 50 weeks a year, give her two weeks vacation, she works 2,000 hours. Right. So she could see 1,000 people twice a year for an hour cleaning. I get my teeth cleaned for an hour twice a year. She could treat 1,000 people. Well, the average office is getting 25 new patients a month, so every three and a half years, you'd add another growing. hygienist. Right. But that's not what you see anywhere. You, no. you see dentists practice from age 25 to 35, one hygienist. 35 to age 45, one hygienist. 45 to 55, one hygienist. Just... And now they're 65 years old. They're in Parsons, Kansas, population 30,000. I say, hey, buddy, what do you need? He says, I, I need new patients. No, How do you no. recommend new patients? Like, dude, you've burned through everyone in Parsons, Kansas, and the outlying towns. I mean, right. so so nobody, I mean, I have not met When's the last time you met a dentist who's in their 40s saying, well, actually, I, I can't accept any patients. You know, I, I only want to check three hygienists and they're all booked out. They have no... Actually, we have do no. have that in our, in our marketing group. You have a, what dentist that accepts no new patients? I, we, they, we had to turn it off. We had uh, Johnny Shanks. And we started his marketing. He's going gangbusters and his pay-per-click campaigns and direct mails were doing so great. He's like, I can't handle this at the level and so we shut it off for about four months recalibrated the team hired new people expanded got more bandwidth and then turned it back on so yeah if you're if you're paying attention like you do it happens but but the, but the point is the point is dentists in their mo in their mindset and their model no americans are happy you you sit down with any 65 year old lady who's born and raised in the same town and say, have you been seeing basically one dentist your whole life? She's like, hell no. They, the, the Americans are changing every five years because of uh, something that one of the staff said. They made them feel bad. They don't remember which tooth they worked on, but they remember how you made them feel. Right. And, and the dentists all want to spend all their money on advertising. They don't want to do anything for patient loyalty. They don't want to pay money to educate their staff and bring them to no. townie no. meeting, but they want to sit there and spend 3% of collections on direct mail and billboards and Facebook ads. And it's kind of funny because corporate America, <laughs> corporate America is all into loyalty programs. I mean, right. I mean, Chase Credit Card, American Airlines, right. Costco, they, they've had Walmart, they, right. they've had every American in their office one time. It's kind of like Care Credit. Care Credit has 95% of the dentists have Care Credit in their office. So they're not interested in new patients, right. new customers. They're trying to get their existing customers to use their product more. Exactly. And, and dentists, so, so, so when dentists throw corporate under a bus, I'm like, well, dude, why, why do you still need new patients after 25 right. years? Well, if you're, if you're, either side of the fence, it works, right? My philosophy is sit down with that patient and say, I've got one, one goal, only one goal, to help you be as healthy as you can be and you want to be. And then I'm going to get you so healthy, maybe you don't even need to come and see me anymore. Come and see the hygienist and then send all your friends because I want you healthy. That's my goal. That's what dentists, when you say what I wish dentists focused on more was how can I get my patients so damn healthy they don't need to come back here. I mean, how often do you need to have your dentistry redone? Like zero. I, I had dentistry I, done I always got mine 17 done. years ago. Zero. I always got mine done with uh, gold. I have seven restorations. They're all gold. Right. They're all zinc phosphate. My associate at the time, Sam Dominic, did them all. Now he has his own practice. Right. And and I brush and floss every morning and every night, and, and I've, I've never had an issue. We had a guy call us the other day, and I swear to God, you can't make this stuff up. He goes, I'm a young dentist, and what I want to target are younger people so that 15 years from now, I have a really nice annuity in my practice, and I won't need to get any more new patients. And the marketing team comes to me, and they go, how do you market for that? And I go, let me get this clear. 
He wants to just basically get a bunch of people in the door, have supervised neglect for 15 years, watch these people fall apart, so then he's got some freaking dentistry to do? Like, that is jacked up. That is... <laughs> but that's the mindset. But you that's know, another another mindset. thing I've always done when I um, introduce these new patients, I always hand them my card, and I say, look, I'm... The buck stops here. I, right. I own this place. No, no one else owns this place. Only right. I own this place. This is my... Email Howard at todaysdental.com. Right. That is my cell phone. You dial that number. This thing rings. Yep. yep. No one else. There's the office number. And, yep. and I said, you can, uh, you know, if you're embarrassed talking about it, you can email it to me. You right. can text me. You can call me. But if you have a problem, I want to be the first to know about it. Well, you've got leadership. And that's what it takes. If you're a hygienist, you're a dentist, you're, you're front office, you've got to say, the buck stops here. Oh, my God. We were... <laughs> Total sidetrack. My husband and I were hiking around uh, Puna, Hawaii, a couple weeks ago, and we go down this little path. Swear to God, there's a coconut at the base of this tree, and it says Buck. And we looked at it, and we said, well, I guess Buck stopped here. You know? You know whose turn that was? Harry S. Truman. Oh, my gosh. What a great turn. And he was from um, Missouri. You know what the S stood for? No. S. Oh, that's funny. That was his middle name, S. Yes. That was the, them are. Uh, I love. I love those Midwestern hillbilly stories. Yeah. You know, my uh, my dad's brother had a son, and his name was Bud. Yeah. That was his, his real name, Bud. Bud. And guess what he's named after? The beer. A Budweiser beer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. His, his greatest thing was beer, so he named his son Bud. I'm we, like, we had a whole only in dog. Kansas and Missouri and maybe uh, parts of Oklahoma and Texas you get that. So you just came out with your latest book frustration yeah the breakfast of champions yes where, where can they get that book uh, you can get it on amazon amazon uh, yep you can get it as a ebook or paperback and we'll have a few in the breakout session well you know afternoon. the difference between the ebook and the paperback what um i got a book on there too it, it's all the millennials all do audio right and um they um so i i and came out got, with a i came out with a uh, a book and it was paperback or hardback or whatever and um Cells are doing great, but all these people kept asking me, well, when is it going to be an audio? When is it going to be an audio? So, so finally, I sat down with Ryan, and he turned it on, and yep. I read my book. It took me five and a half hours to sit down and read my you book. You reminded me, my audio The right audio up. book, did you do it? Yeah, but I haven't uploaded it to Amazon yet. It blew the hardcover away, and, and Jeff Bezos um, talks about it now. I mean, I think now audio books are 85% of wow. book sales. Okay, you've inspired me because yeah, Because, like, 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 let's say you go want to get that book, uh, John Coy's talking about the heart right. attack gene. Right. When are you going to have five and a half hours to sit in a chair? Right. But you got an hour commute to work each day. So, you can so in two and a half day. days, just driving to work, you could do that book. True. Or when, you, or when you're on Hona, Hona Kona on that hike. Right. You right. could listen to that the whole time during the hike, but there you go. But bo books are dying because um, Audio. Sapien are too. They're too hyper. They're too attention deficit. They're, they 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 want to do three things at one time. Yeah. And sitting in a chair reading a book with no pictures is a hard sell to a monkey. Well, okay. So, so what is so what is the name of your book? Frustration: The Breakfast of Champions. Talk about that. So. It was something that was rolling around in my head for a long time, and I would talk to people. I always, I, my first question is always, what's your dream? Not what are you doing now, but what was your dream? And when people get to that, nine times out of ten, they were like, yeah, but that's never going to happen, or I gave up on it, or things like that. And when I would dig deeper, I go, why did you give up? And they go, well, I just got frustrated, and I gave up. And I thought, God, that's really interesting because frustration to me is a motivator. I call frustration, that that's it. Okay. I think frustration is a crossroad emotion. It's one of those, I almost put it in a neutral category. People put it in a negative. But when I'm frustrated about something, it means I want, I want something to happen. I want to create something. I want to do something. I want to have something that I don't currently have or I'm doing or I'm being. And so when I'm frustrated, you got one or two choices. You can become an emotional alchemist, which I love being, and add a drop of curiosity or perspective or joy or reevaluation, and you'll break through and you'll get that thing that you wanted, right? Or you'll recline to it, you'll get angry, you'll get disappointed, and you'll give up. And then you go, well, that's for other people, that's not for me. So if there was one emotion that propelled me from assistant to hygienist to office manager, back to business school, to consultant, to owner, it was frustration. I would get frustrated and I would say there's got to be a better way of doing things. There's got to be a different solution. There's got to be a way. Other people have done it. I can do it. 
how do I break through this? Because it's the number one emotion where people get stuck. So if you head it out and just go, all right, there it is. Let's just serve it up with a little bowl of milk. And, and I actually create a, an emotional council. It sounds really weird, but when anger, frustration, jealousy, things like that pop up, instead of repressing them or ignoring it, kind of sit around at a table and it's a board meeting and I go, okay, anger, it's your turn. What are you really angry about here? And deal with it. Jealousy, what are you, what's coming up for you? What's got to be right? What, what's creating these emotions? Because it's all energy and motion, Howard. It's just energy and motion, and you got to learn to pay attention to it and hear the message. Because once you do that, then you break through and you're on the other side. Man, you're crushed on Amazon. Every single one of your reviews is five star. I only got one. No, no, you got, they're, <laughs> but they're all five star. Oh, uh, no, awesome. that, 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 that is amazing. And, and you have another book. Yeah. I love the way you, uh, fundamentals, but the word fun, F U N, fundamentals. Dentists go to courses, they want to learn about bleaching, bonding veneers. Right, they want right, to learn about right, all right. the wear rates of composites when right. their fillings don't wear down. Right. They want to learn about all the mega pascals of the bonding agents when other yeah. fillings fall out. They, they want to go listen to. Uh, some dentist who doesn't know organic chemistry to tell him which bonding agent works the best right. when when 3M has like 65 doctorates of organic chemistry who took like five years to make this glue right. and Ivy Claire has another 65 doctors of organic chemistry to make this glue and I'm sitting here like Okay, if you put 65 doctors on a bottle of glue, I'm sure it's gluey. It's it's gonna stick. But they don't face the demon. The demon is their fillings don't wear down, their fillings right. don't fall out. And if I ask them, dude, what 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 keeps you up at night? What what makes you just want to just hit punch a wall? Right. It's always the staff. Right. The staff. Right. They know. They you know. God. They just. Right. And, and so how they deal with it is they they after they're filling, they go in their office and they shut the door. And they go on dental town. Yeah, and, and they go on dental town. <laughs> and you wrote, you wrote, fundamentals of outstanding dental teams. So I'm calling bullshit right out of the gate. These dentists don't have fun with their dental teams. It's their number one Which source is the number of one stress. Which problem. That's the problem. So, so what, what is your book about? How does it address that? How could a dentist? I mean, what? Is, and, and, and these are questions on dental town. My overhead's out of control. Right. I can barely make payroll. And my, my hygienist wants to see me at noon for a raise because the earth right. went around the sun. Right. He just wants to quit. Right. You know, that, that, that's why he wants to sell his office to corporate, so he doesn't have to deal with that bullshit. Exactly. So, so what, what is your book about? What problems does it solve? Um, uh, the Fundamentals was actually really cool because I did that collaboratively back in 1999, probably with Linda Miles, Kathy Jameson, Paul Homily. I just got the best of the best. I was a new consultant. And I said, hey, what's your opinion about this? And we all wrote a chapter. So chock full of amazing info. That one is probably so, so not So this is book. not your book? This yeah, is, that is my book. Is it your book? But you got, so who it's all did you get to write a chapter? Uh, can you zoom in on it? Fundamentals of Outstanding Dental Teams. We got Tony Robbins to write the forward. Oh, my God. How did you get Tony Robbins? He was a good friend. You know, I was with Fortune Management for a while and uh, worked with Tony for about 10 years. Ryan is, and... my son Ryan is just, was just nauseous about it. I was laughing, but he was nauseous. So we got Tony Robbins to come on the show. Mm -hmm. We did a podcast with him. I have 700 podcasts. It's the only one where the video file didn't take. No, no. So it's just a sound file. So if you're on iTunes, it doesn't matter. But on but on uh, YouTube and uh, uh, there, there. But I I told him I said uh, try to get him back. But uh, so you have Paul Bass, Nate Booth, Linda Drevenstead, Carol Hacker, Paul Homily, Dion, yes. Kathy Jameson, Brenda Kaiser, Linda Miles, Penny Reed. Alan and Sandy Richardson, Doug Smart, forward by Tony Robbins. Um, that, that is a classic. It is a classic. And, and what, what is the theme of the book? Um, I would say it, it really comes down to your vision, and that's where the doctors fail to work. And if you go to some bullshit, I'm sorry, did I say that out loud? If you go to something and you're writing out some fluffy one-page thing about excellence and all that, that's not your vision. Right? That's not your vision. And I don't really believe in having the whole team sit around and write the vision of the company. Now, that they might write their code of conduct, which is another piece of it, but get really clear in your mind who you are and what you want to do. I mean, Bruce and I talked about this yesterday. 
There's two basic leadership styles in dentistry, and you've touched on them. One is the comfort lifestyle, and the other one is the achievement lifestyle. So comfort lifestyle dentist says, I want a great business. I want to be a small giant. I want to throw off great cash flow. I want to be able to come and go when I please. I want to have a happy team that's congruent. My patients are happy, all of that. So you're probably a one doctor, one and a half doctor, maybe two doctor practice, and you've got these agreements. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg is uh, a great comfort guy, right? He's got Facebook and all that, but he runs around town in a hoodie and tennis shoes, and he's not he just is in it. He's still involved in his company, right? So that's a comfort-driven vision. The other is the achievement-driven, which is what you're talking about with multi-offices, big groups, and higher mountains. I conquered this. Now I have to conquer that. Now I have to conquer that. Bruce is like that. That's why Bruce has had 15 companies since the time I've known him in 12 years, right? So figure out who you are. Get really clear on your vision, what works for your lifestyle, and then say to hell with it right? Everybody I hire is going to line up with this vision. You're going to give them an opportunity to come on board with it. And then we play this game together and it's fun. But the frustration comes is because I'm a high achieving practice here and I got Debbie Downer over here and I don't have the kahunas to ask her to go find her happy place. And so it'll happen again this afternoon. I will look out in the audience and I'll, I will point blank say to every dentist and hygienist here, if you're not happy where you're at, get happy or go find some place where you can be happy. And it really is as simple as that. And it's so simple, we trip over it and, and you don't get it. So get your vision, articulate it with as much love and concern and passion as you can and then have the team line up and say this is our code of conduct this is how we act we we hire grown-ups we're not here to train you to put your cell phone away during work hours you should know better and and get with a program let's work together be one purpose you know be one they purpose. just a, a social animal doesn't want to have an uncomfortable conversation Right. Because it's so survival. Don't make, it un- don't make it uncomfortable. Yeah, the, their, their survival is if the, you know, um, when, when they study sapiens the last two million years, usually the herd is about 100, 140. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's how many they think we were. And uh, which is really amazing because now um, the anthropologists are freaking out because they're seeing the Facebook data where the average Facebook person has 140 right. friends. And those numbers are so eerily exact Similar. that now they they're all thinking okay the sapien has a biological capacity for about 140 relationships from um a few really deep ones a lot of really shallow ones some in the middle whatever um but i i, I always tell these dentists that um you know um every tribe is different they have different I- foods different languages different cultures different music and and it's not that it's that it's uh, right or wrong. It's just that you that's don't, who you, you are. You don't fit this tribe. Yeah. And I, I yeah. always thought I was firing someone, which they say is their most stressful thing. I, I always thought it was easy because I'm like, I'm just like Vicky. Uh. If this <laughs> if this tribe was good for you, you'd be so happy, and right. you're miserable. Right. And that's not I'm wrong and right. you're wrong or I'm right. right or right. Maybe we like country music and you're a rapper. I exactly. mean, who cares? Right. But I'm going to liberate you from your misery yes. because you're not, for some reason, you're not able to pull the plug to say, this right. ain't working for me. So right. I'm going to help you out. I'm going to give you two weeks. I'm going to give you a week of uh, severance pay for every year you've worked here. Yep. And and one of them was the funniest one ever because uh, I loved her, <laughs> but she was miserable. And I told her, I said, you know, it's not that my assistant bothers you. It's not that, right. you know, you, you think that you don't get along with Jan or these other people, but, but I, I, I see you, you don't like people, period. You don't even <laughs> like the patients. And I said, you know what? The only thing that I see you light up on is when you're talking about your gardening. I right. said, it's never your husband. Right. It's never your two kids. Right. It's never the patient. It's only, go- I said, go, go to a gardening place. She still comes in with her husband and kids, and she went, there's like two miles up the street from Elliott on Baselines, this big nursery. Right. So she actually went over there. She loves it. Isn't that great? And I told her only a plant could get along with you. There you go. So work with plants. She found her happy yeah. place. Yeah, and, and, and people are complex, and they're exhausting to some people, and some yeah. people just don't have the energy for it. Right. Well, there is a system that can help you 
um, in that case, we always say there's no defects in people, which is what you were saying. There's no defect in you. You just belong with plants, and that's great. There's no defects in people, only in the system. And a lot of times we have a really, really terrible onboarding system because we're in this crunch and you go, God, I just need a warm body, you'll do, plug them in. And they go, oh, she's pretty excited, that's great, we're all burned out, let's dump all of our crap on her. Pretty soon she's burned out and everybody's running around the office going, oh, she's just not the same person that we interviewed. I think she faked her interview. No, probably what happened is we either didn't do detailed testing on the way in and we needed a detailed person and we got a big picture person right and she was all excited and enthusiastic so we hired her and we're like oh but you're really in charge of something that's highly detailed so we had a mismatch there and then there's four stages of learning that's in this book too uh, first is enthusiastic beginner you would hope everybody coming on board day one is pretty excited about stuff and then they get in there and they hit the wall and it's called disillusioned learner. And they go, ooh, this is not quite what I thought. They're a little crazier than I thought, or the patients are a little different than I thought, or I don't like the uniforms, or whatever it is, right? They get a little disillusioned. That's where most people want to quit. So if you ever have that employee you hire and three weeks later they're out the door, they hit stage two of learning and they're like popped right out. Stage three is reluctant contributor. You've trained and trained and trained and trained and trained. You know they know how to do their job. You know they know how to do their job, and they're just jacking with you that because they won't do it, right? And so that's a confidence kind of piece, and that's where the boss wants to fire them, and they're really struggling going, I know I'm supposed to know, but I just need a little more, right? So understanding their styles of learning. If you get through that, though, then you hit peak performer, and then you go, man, this is the best best hygienist, best assistant, best front office person I've ever had. But you never escape those four cycles. Even tying your shoes, when you learn that, you, you go through those four cycles. So understanding that and knowing how to help people best learn if they're auditory, right, or visual or kinesthetic or they need it repeated 11 times. I, I, there are a lot of millennials that need things repeated 11 times. So just record it and go, here. Like if you don't want to teach 11 times, you got to find 11 ways for them to hear it. And that's what gets frustrating, you know, is because you think, you think you've got it all trained, you think you've got it all together, and then they pop a cork and you don't know why, right? So um, what, do you, what do you teach at the Productive Dentistry Academy? I teach a lot of things. I teach... Um, now, now, on the, the, the initial two and a half day course yes. in Dallas, are yes. you part of that? I am. And what what are you? Um, how, is it mostly you and Bruce? It was or only you and Bruce. No, nope, it was, and I'm really working on empowering my team as well. So in the beginning, Bruce taught scheduling, risk factors, doctor's diagnosis. I would teach the team breakouts. So I would teach the team building portions, how to get along with each other, telephone skills. Uh, accounts receivable. Summer and I would talk about what the assistant's role were. I did a hygiene breakout. I did everything. But you can't grow doing that. So now we have uh, amazing hygienist, Catherine Gilliam, who does our hygiene breakout. Uh, so we have um, probably a six hour. On day two, we break out for about six hours and every department gets their own leader. So we have Angela Sullivan, Carrie Miller, do a fabulous breakout session for the Those office Those are two managers. hygienists? No, office managers. So, I, I want to podcast them all. Okay. Because I get nothing but great reviews about the Productive Industry Academy. And yeah. they, they come out of school $350,000 in student yeah. loans, and your average client collects 280000 more the first year. Within 12 months. Within yeah. 12 months. Within five years, the average, the median average is up 538000 The The mean, the, the mean is 700000 The median is 538000 So What's growing. the mode? What's the, I don't know the mode. The mean. You know what the mode <laughs> I is? I didn't get the mode. The, the mode is I, the repeating numbers. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't calculate so you the have mode. So you have to find out which number repeats the most. Yeah, we just broke it down, and we said for practices that come in under 800,000, they grow on average in the first four years. Uh, with us, they'll grow 95%. So they're doubling, which and, under... And, and what, what, do you, what do you think they're learning that makes them um, so much more productive? Um, I think the doctors are learning to delegate in a way that they can trust. I, and sapien is a control freak animal. Yeah, and so pulling that control so, freak so, out. So so why why do why do some dentists have no problem delegating? And some dentists, if you want it done right, you gotta do it yourself. And can you change that in a in a monkey? Oh oh yeah. Oh yeah. 
it's the engineer, non-engineer thing. We just teach them to, to talk non-engineer. And that's what Chris Moriarty's great at, and you podcasted with him. He's got his master's in behavioral economics, so we talk about those things. So we've got Chris that talks about that. We've got Robin that talks about the energy bus and getting everybody on the team. We've got Summer that talks about what it takes to be a proactive dental assistant and keep up with a doctor who's producing 2,000 an hour, 3,000 an hour. And she started, when Bruce started PDA, he was doing 1,200 an hour. And two years before that, he was doing 800 an hour. And a year before that, he was doing 400 an hour. And it sucked. Like the suckiest places to be are under $1,000 an hour. And people think that $1,000 an hour is going to kill them, and it doesn't. What happens at $1,000 an hour is that it's mandatory they get one week off every six weeks. Like we give them breaks because you're burning so much mental energy that the doctor needs to go away and refresh. That's why, they, that's why there's CE junkies, right? Because I can't justify a vacation every six weeks, but probably need to learn something new in Vegas you know? yeah. <laughs> without my wife and kids and all of that, right? Yeah. So, and, and so I, and it's I, a recharge. I, and I it's always thought that was the, um, the dark side of like these industries, like the Panky Institute, uh, the Spear, the Koi, so many of these institutes, I always thought, you know the dark side of the, all these institutes? What's that? Is they're so stressed out in their office Instead of just staying in there and facing the problems and getting their house in order, right. it's so nice just to go to the airport, fly to Scottsdale or Seattle right. or Key Biscayne, check into a resort, have room service, go learn all this esoteric stuff about bonding and occlusion <laughs> and wear rates, and you recharge all your batteries, then you go in there Monday morning and you go back to hell yeah. because your house is not in order, because you don't have the right people on your team, because right. you won't stand up to your staff and you won't fire Lillian who what does she have to do to get fired drive her car through oh the God. building and park it in the waiting room I mean you know so so yeah, instead of face and, and so many of these dentists who only take the minimum amounts of continued education have these killer offices because right. instead of flying around the world you know learning articulating paper they're actually getting their own house in order yeah I often say dentists only have two fears one that their patients will leave them and two, that their team will leave them. And it's irrational. And one office I coached, literally, this uh, he came and he said, what am I gonna do? My office manager, who's been with me, she was with my dad, she's been in this practice for 40 years. I just found out that she's been embezzling with us, doing insurance fraud for the last 10 years. What am I gonna do? And I said, well, I don't understand the question. And he goes, well, do I fire her or do I keep her? And I said, I, I don't understand the question. She's not an employee, she's a thief. She's a thief. I know she looks like your grandmother and she raised you, but she's stealing and it's your license. She's committing insurance fraud. You, uh, are you, are you, Did asking, you hear about the one in Alaska you asking, should yesterday? You, should you call the cops? You know, is that the question? Did you hear the one in Alaska the other day? What's that? Oh my God. There's a thread on dental time. I woke up this morning and was reading this thread. It's crazy. Let, let me see. Um, um, it's called... What we say is that you have to replace your wishbone with a backbone. Nice. Yeah, so I wish my team with this. I wish my whatever. I wish my patients. You just, you got to called This backbone. thread's called on Dental Town. It's called Alaska Doc looking at jail time. So this townie was on Dental Town in like 2014 talking about how he opened up his practice in the first year he did $3 million. Holy crap. And a lot of people in the are thinking, you know, they felt like, wow, you know, this guy's a genius. And uh, turns out, um, he found this loophole that Alaska and Medicaid, they were paying um, $178 for every 15 minutes IV sedation. The guy billed $2 million of wow. IV sedation. He billed over half uh, of all the IV sedations in dentistry for the state for of the Alaska. State. And so Alaska went in there and he was doing IV sedations during cleanings, fillings, profies, all this stuff like that. And, um, and he basically just asked every That's single federal. person, do you want to be... Knocked out, and they say, yeah. So they took him in front of the court, and the judge, and the, the prosecutor said, we want his uh, passport, and we want $250,000 bail. We think this guy's a flight risk. But, uh, but you know, it, it's, that, that's kind of uh, a sociopath because extreme. you found a loophole. And, and, and what, what, what pisses me off about that is, um, you know, these Americans buy their $800 iPhone with their own money. Right. They buy their, how much, you're, you're, you're uh, Wisconsin, how much is a Ford 150 pickup truck going for these days? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, what, what is an F-150? 
I don't I don't drive one. Well, but, actually, but, we do but, drive but one. what what do you what do you think they're going at? Probably around 30, 36. I have a very good dentist friend. He yeah. got it maxed out with all the be- every yeah. bell and whistle. He paid 98 grand Holy for crap. it. Holy crap. So so the so in every other real industry, the consumers paying out of pocket for everything. Right. So then dentists get these employers or government to subsidize some of the payment. Right. And then they expect that they employer or that government to, to pay them even more money and more money and pay for everything. It's like, dude, why don't you grow some balls and get your people to pay for their dentistry, right. which is the only thing you see in all of Asia, all right. of Africa, right. all of Central and South America. Right. And they, they, they tell me that is a perverted incentive. Yes. You, I mean, yes. you, you shouldn't subsidize well, someone's treatment for their own behavior. Right. They don't brush, they don't floss, they drink a two liter mo- bottle of Mountain Dew. Right. And, and your government or Medicaid or your 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 boss should this pay for pay your that. fillings. Right. I, I mean, the, the Chinese thing is insane. And then here's some dentist that finds oh, Medicaid cool. trying to help people that are afraid. Right. They're scared. Fear of dentistry is huge. Right. So we'll, we'll cover IV sedation. And then this guy bills Two million dollars of IV sedation That's on crazy. people getting a profi. That's crazy. I mean, I mean, you have to be a sociopath. Right. Yeah. Well, you got to have a criminal mind that I don't. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, you're. Have, I mean, right? I mean. Well, I I always saw dentistry as a sacred, sovereign profession. I mean, when I sell you an iPhone, I'm not allowed to touch you. I'm not allowed to take your head and lean you back. <laughs> and, and this is this is sacred territory. It is. And and, 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 is. and the Supreme Court saw it as sacred territory because when you go back to um, 1900s and the book that uh, explains this got a Pulitzer Prize, Paul Starr, 1984, The Rise and Fall of the American Healthcare Decision, they saw such fraudulence, but the, the Supreme Court and the government said the problem is, is you know what a cup such of coffee trust. is. You know what a bottle of water is. Right. But when someone tells you you have prostate cancer. Right. All you, you, have, is you, all you have is trust. All you have is so trust. So they flipped it. They said, from now on, doctors are guilty of the exam, diagnosis, and treatment plan until they prove themselves innocent. Exactly. And we're going to set up a state board that's going to be the judge, juror, the executioner of the dental school, medical school. Right. Your dental license. Right. So they can close down a complete dental school. They can take away your license, and that piece of shit from Alaska should have his license taken oh, away. More than that, be- because more than because that. yeah, and he should go yeah. to jail. Yeah. Because here's a taxpayer saying we feel sorry for people that are really afraid of the dentist, and then he bills half of all the IV sedations in the state of Alaska. For how many years? That's well, the he's only doing three. I think three. Okay. So that's pretty quick. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I mean, it is a sacred, sovereign profession. It's I not. Agree. We don't sell widgets. No. So, no. so what uh, what are you lecturing about uh, today? Um, I'm going to do frustrations, the breakfast of champions. So we're going to talk about how to get ourselves centered and grounded, and maybe um, get off our own self improvement wheel and get on a little bit of self healing wheel. Because the question behind the question in self improvement is, I'm not good enough what can I do to get better, right? So I think skill set improvement is great. But everybody's gonna walk away knowing that as a, as a human being, you're already perfect. And we're gonna take it from that place. So if I stop judging myself. But, that, but that's not true because I was my, raised Catholic well, and we were born with original sin. <laughs> And well, I guess my great grandfather ate an apple. Yeah. Which is kind of strange because since then, no one in my pedigree has eaten an apple. Right. Our family doesn't eat fruits or vegetables, but evidently. So I was just saying. So, you know, you've so got, you're saying you don't believe in will. original sin from eating an apple? I'm saying that the original sin is you've got free will and let's choose good. Let's choose good. Let's choose good for ourselves first. And then we can at least come from this place of I don't have to judge you so harshly during the day, then I won't be judged. So I want to break the cycle of judgment within our team. If we can do that, if we can just break our own inner critic and get it on our side, then the whole day is going to flow a lot better. So we're going to talk about how to get our, it's, it's a muscle that you are. Are you, are you saying that, that people are telling themselves bad things about themselves? I'm saying that we all have emotional intelligence and some of us have it at a higher degree than others. So when you're in this First, there's self-awareness, then there's awareness in others. Then there's this place where you choose to belong to this tribe. And if I'm gonna choose to belong to this tribe, then every time I can check myself emotionally before I just blurt something out that's gonna hurt feelings or cause problems or create confusion, then I'm gonna contribute to the tribe in a better way, 
right? So it's going to be about emotional intelligence. We're going to have a lot of fun with that. We're going to learn how it's energy and motion, how to change our body so that our mind follows. So it's the whole mind-body connection and what we bring to the table every day when we walk through the door. So we're going to learn a lot about team building. We're going to learn a lot about how to help our patients feel more comfortable, how we earn that trust, keep that trust, break that trust. So all those things that you're talking about. You know, it's funny because the, the biggest letdown I ever had in my life was I, I literally believed in college that if you if you learned and got A's in calculus and chemistry and physics and organic, if you learned all the science, it'd be the keys to unlock the universe. Right. You'd be successful from there on out. And then you find out that you'll never use any of that bullshit one time. Right. I mean, who, who uses geometry or calculus or, you know, no, no one asked me a derivative of anything. And it's all the people skills. 68% of your success oh. is people skills. Oh. 68%. So two thirds. Two thirds are Has people nothing skills. to do with algebra. Right. It has to do with your people skills. Yeah. So we're going to work on people skills. And, and I see that in dental offices where de dentists, dentists, well, all humans are complex. Right. But like, you don't know how many speakers that I have sat out there and watched, and you're watching this guy and he's in a suit and he's doing his slides and you're basically thinking, you know, if I didn't know this guy, you'd Can almost, I do mine think, without slides? You, you'd almost <laughs> think he was a jerk. Yeah. And then as soon as the seminar is over, you know, he, he goes and gets in his jeans and t-shirt and you, you go uh, trout fishing in, in, the, in the bayou, right. catching redfish for three days, drinking yellow kerosene. Right. And that was his best dental lecture for three days. Ever. You know, and it's the same thing. You're writing to work. How many times has this happened to me? You're writing to work with a dentist. Coolest dude in the world. Right. Great. And then he walks in his office, walks up to the front, looks at the schedule. There's a two-hour opening. And the first thing he says to staff is like, what the what the shit's happening from two to four? Right. Wait, what, 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 what's going on in two to four? Right. Did you guys confirm the... And I'm like, dude. Right. You didn't even say good morning. Right. You were... You, you know, it's like... So learning how to... The, the people, it's, it's everything. Right. It's just everything. Right. Yeah. So that's that's what we're going to work on this afternoon. Some dentist was talking about that on Dental Town the other day. He said he just felt horrible because his 10-year-old come home and he said, uh, Dad, I got a 98 on my math test. And his son was so happy. And what flew out of his mouth was, well, wh which finish? two Which two did you miss? Aww. And he saw his son just melt. Yeah. And then the rest of the day, his dad's like, why, Why did, did that I fall that? out of my ass? Yeah. Why did I yeah. say that? You know, but yeah. that's what we do. Yeah. So, um, so, um, how often do you do these productive dentistry courses? They're about three times a year. Only three times yeah. a year. Wow. Yeah. So what, what is the date to now and when's the next one? This is, uh, um, the next one is May 8th. And so this is April 21. Yep. So in two weeks, we'll be back so in, in Dallas. So in two weeks, you'll be back in Dallas. Yep. Yeah. And then in September. Well, I can uh, I can vouch for my town. He's uh, did you pay any money to get on this show? No, no. The, I'll, I'll bill you afterwards. <laughs> but uh, I I asked her to come back, and the, the only reason I got her to come back is because I get so much amazing feedback from Dennis that went to Bruce. I've known Bruce Baird and you guys. I'm, I've known you guys for three decades. But it's um what I my only analogy I can do to uh, the Productive Dentistry Academy is um. I was so scared doing my little single implant and, and you know, and I was just everything. And then I flew all the way from Phoenix to Pittsburgh and did uh, Carl Misch's uh, seven right. three-day weekend course. And the first time I saw Carl, he had a patient put to sleep and he flapped the whole upper, the oh. whole lower, placed like eight implants upper, eight implants lower, while the whole time... He's talking to me and he keeps looking at me and talking and asking me all about me. And I'm just like, why is this guy even looking at me? And, 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 and to retract the linguals, he would reflect the lingual of, of the mandible and he'd sew the, the, the lingual on the right to the lingual of the left. And I mean, wow. and he did all this. But when I saw that, it was kind of like I went to war and watched, you know, it was, it was like I'm at home with my BB gun right. shooting target practice. And then they send me off to war and I see like a hundred people blown up the first day. And you went back and it did something to your mind where now it was no problem laying a bigger flap, seeing the right. bone. Right. And these guys have to punch through a production wall. I mean, if yeah. you look at the average, what is the average dentist? So, so if the average dentist works 40 hours a week, that's 2000 hours a year. Well, nobody works 40 hours a week. And, uh, okay. So, so, um, how many? 1800. How, 1800 yep so what does the average dental office um collect 
Oh, I... 7.45? Yeah. So 7.45 divided by 1,800... The average dental office, including hygiene, collects four hundred and thirteen dollars an hour. Right. And and their overhead is and their overhead the is two thirds. Right. Sixty five percent. Right. And if you can just see someone, what what, what is what is Bruce Cruz at now? Cruz. Per hour? He's cruising over three thousand. So when you see someone doing three thousand dollars an hour, it just blows some shit in your noodle it recalibrates uh, it and you know what the bigger and, part is and that'll and that'll make and if it just got you to from 413 if it just got you to 828 you went from a 745 practice taking home a buck 45 to now you got a one and a half million dollar practice taking home 300 and that's if you just yeah. did a fraction of what bruce does and bruce is no spring chicken he's what 61 yeah and you're and you're 35, yeah. rocking a six pack, going to Orange Theory Fitness class, and <laughs> well, you're doing 413. I think here's the here's the true measure of productivity, though. It's not it's not in the quantity that you do; it's in the quality that you do. So when you when you really pull back the hood of Bruce's practice, he's doing that volume of care with almost zero remakes. Right. Like his patients aren't coming back a month from now. Hey, doc, this tooth hurts. They're not coming back a year from now, redoing a mess. You well, can't... well, the dentists, the dentists say mutually exclusive things. They go, well, guys like that, they they don't care about quality. And I uh, go, okay. Well, how long does it take you to do a molar root canal? They go an hour and a half. I say, how long does it take the endodontist? Fifty minutes. Okay. Right. Well, whose is better? How long does it take the oral surgeon to pull four wisdom teeth? Right. 12 minutes experience how long did it take you to pull that one wisdom tooth you're in there for an hour and a half digging out one molar yeah. time so, doesn't equal quality so it, it, no it actually regina herzlinger wrote an entire book called um um i think health equals wealth or or the um the focus factory i forget but she showed that uh, she started with hernia operations that the the people who do them under five minutes have like a 2% failure rate. Right. By the time you get to 15 minutes, it's a 10% failure rate. She called it the focus factor. I was going to say, it's all about when, focus. When, when, when your team is trained, when you have the materials, when right. everybody knows what's going on, you can prep, impress, temporize a crown in 30 minutes. Right. And when you're dilly-dabbling around for an hour and a half, right. could it possibly be that you have no freaking idea what you're what doing? You're doing? That you never this. train your staff? Let's try that. <laughs> that they rinse dry look, rinse dry and then they ask, and then they got 29 burrs on a burr block, right. and then have their assistant take their gloves off and go to Central Stars Asian because they, the need, another, they need another burr. Now, I'll throw Bruce under a bridge right now. Even the greats, Bruce Beard, Hornbrook, all these amazing doctors, they still use 10 times more burrs than they'd ever need to. Yeah, I think Bruce uses two. That, does he use two? Yeah, two, maybe three. And he's electric. He he preps electric and no water. Yeah. So he's he's getting after it. He's like, I would melt a tooth if I stayed on it more than a couple minutes. That is he the just, biggest problem. When you when yeah. you talk to um, when you talk to Patterson, Shine, Benko, Burkhardt, and they go in there and the group practice says, well, our supplies are too high. It's like, well, could possibly... Three dentists and five hygienists just agree on burrs. one glove. Right. Could one you glove, agree on one, one bonding agent? Yeah. Could you could you get the burr block? And, and in fact, a lot of those, a lot of, a lot of the, the assistants, um, you know, if, if they set up a burr block to ten and you only use three, right. Well, the whole thing goes back to central sterilization. Right. So a lot of these burrs that have never been used, by the time you They're use it, out. you throw it away because right. it's been autoclaved twelve times. Yeah. I agree. Well, I think the good news in productivity, just so anybody out there listening doesn't get overwhelmed, is that it's 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 your path and it doesn't have to happen overnight we find that a fifty dollar an hour increase from wherever you're at brings you the ability to take your next breath right so if you're swimming in debt 50 bucks an hour, 76,000 in a year, no, 50, 50 thousand of that's going to fall to the bottom line if you do nothing but just collect 50 bucks an hour more and then we reach on the next $50 and the next $50 and the next because every 50 to $100 an hour in increase you're going to have to recalibrate your systems right so the assistants need to be trained a little bit different way the scheduling is going to be tweaked a little bit different way the collections will change and something different so you want to go in a measured pace so that your team can keep up with you so nobody ever we never ever ever teach go home tomorrow and raise your goal 300 bucks an hour but what we do teach is that over the course of the year, you can be up that $300 an hour. In fact, you may be up $300 an hour in two weeks, and that's great. But don't change your goal. 
let your team continue to bonus because we set it up based on your profits, your overhead. It's a real number. It's not a feel good number. It's like, this is what you have to do. And I think where doctors get really upset and pissed off is it's, they're never taught about their balance sheet. They're only taught about their cash flow and they, they look at their bank account to guide their business and they forget that I've got all this debt that I'm servicing that comes out not on my P&L, but after EBITDA and, and or they're accelerating their debt payoff because being debt free feels really good. But then they realize that they can't even take that as a write off. So their tax bill is through the roof. So it, it's really PDA has evolved over the last 10 or 12 years to say this is a complicated thing. And when we tweak something here, we want to flow it all the way through. We're going to flow it, the patient experience through your marketing lens. We're going to flow your cash flow through to your CPA and what they're doing because we find out that a lot of CPAs don't really get it and then you get hit with a $98,000 tax bill and you go so we, we kind of feel a responsibility if we're going to help you get that much more productive and you're in a whole new zip code and you've never lived there before there's some financial that can come and bite you so we want you to kind of be aware of those too and plan for it and it's all good stuff when you plan for it. So do you like any CPAs? I mean, you're in I Dallas. Love, yeah, I love CPAs. Who, who do you recommend? There's lots of good CPAs out there. Is there any you recommend? Nope. nope. Because you're in Dallas, you're in Keene Weathers country. Keene Waters does a great job. Keene Waters does a great job. HDC does a great job. HDC? There's, yeah. Who's HDC? Look up HDC. Forget who they're... Uh, and I found out about them through Dental Intel. Their their uh, accounting kind of lines up, so you can get H- your HDC Dental Intel was founded by uh, an accountant. An accountant. So and that's the, a really uh, that's a really tricky one. In the Dental one. Silicon Valley of South Provo. Exactly. Oh my God! There's so many dental companies there. They're it's crazy. HDC Horizontal so, Dental for mm, HDC verification or of patient eligibility. Maybe it's HDA. Dental. HDC is um here's where here's where PDA stops so what we do is it we, might be HDA might be HDA so what we do is Bruce and I came up with a long time ago and Kane Waters might have actually helped us put this together is we reorganize the chart of accounts oh my god HDA is the Hawaiian Dental Association Shh, you still have your vacation on your mind I know you well, live you're, there six months out of the year now so it's, it's you live there half a year I do I do. Wow. In Kona. So let me just wrap up the CPA conversation because this is a takeaway that everybody can do. It was HDA do. Group Dental. There you go. Okay, got it. Okay. So it. anybody can do this and they can email us and we'll give them the template. But reorganize your chart of accounts so that you've got everything in your brackets and it's easy to manage. So you run QuickBooks and at the end of the month, you know exactly where you're at. And we put all the labor costs up front on the top because that's your biggest and that's what you can control the most. Then we put your fixed cost, then we put your variable cost. And this tells you a couple things. Number one, you're either working at capacity and your employee labor cost are balanced. Number two, if your fixed costs are not in balance, the only thing you can do is raise your collections. They're not gonna, rent's not gonna go away, right? And then number three, variable costs, that's where you can negotiate, get better at having three burrs instead of 10, you can uh, change the way you're spending, right? So everything that's a variable cost with your patient flow. And that's where we either turn it back over to your CPA. We don't really have a strong affiliation where we say you must use this group or must use that group. Because PDA is about choice. You know, we want to empower you to build your board of advisors and take great care of your patients and have a great business. Well, I want to thank you uh, for all that you've done for dentistry. I thank know you. you're also uh, a legend uh, amongst hygienists who don't think outside the box. I think once a hygienist, always a hygienist. Mm-hmm. I've seen so many hygienists and dental assistants who uh, uh, kind of wanted to do something else. And dental assistants that became uh, reps for Patterson or Shine or Benko or Burkhardt and now make a six-figure income. Yeah. Um, there's a hygienist in Phoenix who owns 11 offices. Nice. And uh, you're a hygienist. You, you've done so much. And, and like, like the Productive Dentist Academy, you know, sometimes they're sitting there. Sometimes they're burned out. Sometimes they just want to dream or do a deal. And you're so many uh, hygienist dreams. Aw. Uh, you really are. And I even uh, know some of my hygienists. I, I've heard several hygienists say, well, you know, when my two kids 
get into you know first grade or with my two kids right. leave to college i'm going to do what vicky manis does mick manis does so That's great. Uh, well, so thanks for keeping the dream alive for so many people you're welcome thank you all Howard. right thank you